my history. This week, I'm going to do some contemporary stuff. And um, now, I just want to say, some of this stuff may, may be offensive. You may see it as offensive, like how could anyone write that? Particularly, I'm going to share an article that Arnold Jacob Wolf wrote in 1983 that I found. And I imagine that many of you, well, maybe not rich, but many of you will say, uh, this is unbelievable. But um, it's, it's interesting, and I want to get your reaction to it. But first, I want to start with something even more contemporary. And you probably read about this. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Do, do, can I do that? Uh, it's not a big deal if I can't. Um, um, yeah, you can. Okay, good. Okay. I'm going to share, I'm going to share my screen here and uh, let's see, is that New York Times article? Where is that? Okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay. This was just a couple months ago. Uh, a Jewish teacher criticized Israel. She was fired. Jesse Sanders started a job at a synagogue in Scarsdale, Westchester Reform Synagogue. Not very different than Makomsola Lakeside. A little bit bigger but similar neighborhood, similar demographic. Um, and uh, so last summer, Jesse Sander had been on a job at a Jewish school in Westchester County. She was a religious school teacher. Okay. Her boss, uh, who's the director of education, David E. Levy, the equivalent of Ashley, um, came, had come across a recent blog post she had written that renounced Zionism and sharply criticized Israel. Ms. Sander, 26, said in a lawsuit filed on January 25th. So she filed a lawsuit against the, the synagogue for firing her. Now, uh, post, uh, apropos of now that I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think this suit has much legitimacy because basically religious institutions can do whatever they want when it comes to their ideology. But be that as it may, it's the, the, the interest is the fact that she did this. Did she support Hamas when she called herself anti-Zionist? What did she mean? Ms. Sander, who is Jewish, explained her beliefs to the rabbi and said she would not discuss politics in her class. The rabbi said he agreed with much of what she said and later praised her as a good role model for, her, for their students, Ms. Sander said. So this is right after the blog is posted. The rabbi, probably a good, good move, invites her in and says, you know, is this going to affect how you teach? You may have your own opinions, but is it going to affect how you teach? She says, no, it's not. I'm teaching the curriculum that I'm paid to teach. Um, and I'm not going to do politics in class. Rabbi says, great. You know, in fact, I agree with some of what you said, whatever that is. Uh, I'm praised as a good role model. Then one week later, Rabbi Levy and Eli Kornrick, the temple's executive director, uh, they put the blame on the executive director. Sorry, Holly, fired her. When she asked why, Mr. Kornrick said, it's just not a good fit. That's the oldest excuse in the book. In the earlier meeting, I was like, wow, here's a manager who gets it and said, no one should fire you for your political beliefs. And at the next meeting, it was, oh, except for me. Okay, they go on. Um, then Mr. Haber said the synagogue's work, here's the justification. The synagogue's work was based on the religious principle of Klal Yisrael, which calls for strengthening our commitment to Israel and the Jewish people of all lands and working to establish understanding and commonality among the various expressions of Judaism. The firing of Ms. Sander drew abuse from left-wing Jewish groups and highlighted a generational divide over Israel among American Jews that is driving some of Judaism's most delicate internal debates. What is the relationship between Zionism and Jewish identity? Big question. When it comes to Israel, should there be limits to what employees or members of Jewish institutions can believe or say? Ms. Sander began her job at the school last July and was fired 15 days later. Since then, she has worked four part-time jobs to support herself. It's sad, you know, it's not, not, uh, not a good situation for her, but skip all that. Um, at Westchester Reform Temple, rabbis have criticized Israel in the past. In a Rosh Hashanah sermon, Rabbi Jonathan Blake, he's her senior rabbi, criticized extremists, cynical political officials, and wealthy patrons in Israel for promoting a grandiose vision of Jewish totalitarianism as in biblical holy land. But their critiques never challenge the existence of Israel as a Jewish state, as opposed to a state whose structure favors no ethnic or religious group. In a blog post on May 20th, uh, during last year's conflict between Israel and Hamas militants, Ms. Sander and a co-author, Alana Lipkin, wrote that they embrace a position that rejects the Zionism, Zionist claim to the land of Palestine. The post continues, Zionism is not equivalent to or a necessary component of Jewish identity. They also describe Israeli actions against the Palestinians as genocide and accuse Jewish institutions in the United States of spreading one-sided narratives and propaganda about the conflict. Okay. Um, 
let's, let me just read a little bit more. We, we could probably stop now, but I just want, this is a lawyer talking, Mark Stern from the American Jewish Congress. The plaintiff in this case is saying, my individual right to speak is being infringed upon. And that may be true, he said, but that comes up against other people's right to say, we want to form a community of people that share one set of beliefs. So you're not welcome here. You can go and find yourself another synagogue or form a new synagogue, but you can't force people to accept your views. Miss Sanders said she grew up in a reform synagogue in upstate New York, where she was elected president of the youth group, and her mother taught Hebrew school. She described her family as Zionist, but said she began to question those beliefs as a teenager in Hebrew school when her class read a short story that included a debate between the Israeli and Palestinian character. Da, 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 da. Miss Sanders' views on Zionism reflect a growing shift among younger Jewish Americans. This is true. According to a major survey published last year by Pew, slightly less than half of American Jews under the age of 29 describe themselves as feeling an emotional attachment to Israel compared with more than two thirds of Jews over 65. The survey also found that 27% of American Jews said caring about Israel was not an important part of what being Jewish meant to them, a belief sh shared only by 8% of those over 65. Okay, so there are a lot of different issues at play here. So one of the issues, Alice, you got a, Alice, you have a question. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have a question and maybe this so help with the discussion okay I, because i don't really know the, as much as i probably should about the history of zionism but i always thought zionism was i understood it as before the state of israel the 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 desire and the push to to form the state of israel now that there is a state of israel and there has been a state of israel for over 70 years what does Zionism mean today when you say you're a Zionist? That's, that's, a, that, that's a great question. And it is not a clear answer, but I, I think the way most people understand Zionism, it's the idea that a Jewish state should exist and that should be a state for the Jews, for a Jewish majority. That, that, that sort of is, this, the, the crux of this difference here, and yeah, this is a great sort of entry point is, where do these two opinions differ? Like, let's, let's, let's go back to the, the quote of the rabbi on, on, on Rosh Hashanah, where he criticized Israeli extremists and said, you know, this is, this is wrong, these political leaders are wrong, versus what she said in her blog, which is, uh, where, where is that quote again? Um, that, uh, that, uh, there could, that, that there should not be a, a state of Israel uh, and that uh, Israelis are, committi are, are uh, committing genocide. So the difference is she says that there really, it's not necessary for there to be a majority Jewish state, that essentially Israel could be, include the current territories and there would be a Palestinian majority. And that's okay, essentially, that that would be okay. Whereas the kind of reform vision is that we have a Jewish state, that state should uphold equal rights for all people, of course, um, and should be you know, democratic, but that it should be a Jewish state and a refuge for the Jewish people. So these are the two, so I'd say one is Zionist and one is, is, is anti-Zionist. Now, there are shades within Zionism. There are extreme Zionists, you could call them religious Zionists who believe there should be a Jewish state, that it should be governed by Jewish law. And really Palestinians should be expelled, uh, go to Jordan or live you know, subordinate uh, to, to Jewish claims. Then there's the more progressive Zionism, which I would say is probably where the reform movement's at, says there should be a Jewish state, but it should be governed by universal values and ideals. And so, okay. So what we have here is several different layers. So one layer is, is the question of, of, of what we just discussed, uh, anti-Zionism and Zionism. And is, an, so the one layer is, anti, is or one question is, is anti-Zionism outside the pale of reform Judaism? Uh, is it the equivalent of saying, I believe Jesus is the Messiah? You know, we would have no doubt that if somebody came to our synagogue and was teaching religious school students that Jesus was Messiah, you know, they would probably not be welcome as a teacher in the religious school. Wish them well. Sorry, you know, this is not what we want to teach our students. Okay. Is what she believes, not necessarily what she was teaching, because it's clear that she wasn't teaching what she 
believed, you know, evidently. But if she were to teach that, is that outside the pale of Reform Judaism? That's a that's a, that's an interesting question. Second late second kind of question is: Is the synagogue justified in firing her? You know, can you simply say sorry? You know, you 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 may not uh, you may not be teaching that, but we believe our our teachers are role models for students, and you are not a role model because of what you believe and. You know, you have you don't have a right to work here. We decide who we hire and fire, and you're fired. Um, now, forget the legal question. Let's let's assume legally they have the right to fire, but morally, is it the right thing to do? Okay, so let's start with these two questions, and this is probably the most interesting one: Is anti-Zionism outside the boundaries of Reform Judaism? What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, Sue. Um, that's a hard one. It is. Um, but one of the things, um, when we talk about the younger generations not having any Zionistic feelings and not really being able to identify with Israel, um, and then you gave us the statistics of people over 65 and those, you know, younger than 29, uh, well, I'm a good bit older than 65, <laughs> and I do remember vividly before there was a state of Israel. And I'm telling you, it's very, very sad that these young people don't really know our history and mm -hmm. don't know why it is so necessary to have a Jewish state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I will say that this morning I was watching Schindler's List because um, Rabbi Ike is doing that for next week's movie class. Yes. And I thought many, many years ago, but I thought I needed to rewatch it. And in looking at it and then looking at what's happening in the world today and what Putin is doing mm -hmm. and with the rise in anti-Semitism, not only in this country, but almost in everywhere. I mean, it is really important that the state of Israel exists as a Jewish state, in my opinion. And, right. But I don't know how, um, I don't really have an answer to whether she should have been fired or not. It's hard, if she was publishing her beliefs, even though she wasn't teaching them, that's, that's a problem. It's a good point. Because it's a good point. when you put yourself out there, you right. kind of have to suffer the consequences of it. You know, right. one can make that argument. You know, she didn't have to publish that. Um, sure, she has the right to publish it, but there are also consequences when it comes to publishing something. Yeah. Excellent point. Okay, other comments. What What is outside the realm of Reform Judaism? I can tell you that were someone to have published this, let's say, if a reform rabbi were to say something like this 20 years ago, they would certainly be outside the pale. You couldn't get hired by a synagogue. You couldn't, it, it, if, if you were to say this in, let's say an interview for Hebrew Union College, you almost certainly would not get in. Today, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, and because we're gonna look at another article shortly, but, before we do that, what do you think? Is, is, is what she did totally outside the realm and the synagogue was right to fire her? Anyone Evan? agree with, okay. Evan? Who, who agrees with the synagogue's decision? Evan? Yeah. Um, this is me, your mom. Hey, my mom. <laughs> Didn't it used to be that Reform Judaism was anti-Zionist? I mean, yes. not that many years ago. Well, yeah. Uh, Essentially, we, we did this a little bit last week, and that Reform Judaism was essentially anti-Zionist up until World War II. World War II changed it a lot, um, and and uh, but by 1972, Reform Judaism was pretty ensconced in Zionism. Um, you know, there's the year in Israel. Um, there's 
you know, even, even David Ellenson said they wouldn't hire a, an, uh, an anti-Zionist professor at HUC, you know? So I would say Reform Judaism is pretty much in the Zionist camp. Now there is a history um, and, and certainly that history may, may be, you know, important to draw upon now. Um, and we're going to look at a, an article Arnold Jacob Wolf wrote and some interesting stuff, but, but I would say Reform Judaism is pretty Zionist now. Yeah. Other questions? Anyone agree? Anyone totally, totally disagree with the synagogue's decision that they shouldn't have fired her? That this was absolutely wrong, and you know maybe maybe she shouldn't have the right to you know maybe she shouldn't be teaching her views in class. You know she works for an organization. There's a curriculum, but firing somebody just because of something they wrote is wrong in this case. Yeah, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, I have a little problem with it. I mean, I don't feel that strongly, but I think it's a slippery slope, and this has happened in universities and I think we have to be so careful about well we'll fire you um, and aren't we allowed to have and and what views are we allowed I mean you know she could still I wouldn't take her to be anti-semitic I mean I think she still had a love of Judaism even though she had the you know I just don't think we know enough and the extreme of firing I, I don't know is that to be politically correct and make their you know, there's rabbis that follow their own conscience, like Heschel, I would say. And then there's right. rabbis who are very um, subservient at the extreme to what is their political is going to be most advantageous. I just think there's a lot of things to. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. So maybe, yeah, maybe it wasn't the right approach to fire her just because of her views. If she was a good teacher and you know, her, you know, she got the job done and was reliable and, and, you know, taught what she was supposed to teach, you know, she's entitled to have those views. Um, you know, my guess is, I don't, of course, I don't know the whole story. My guess is knowing how synagogues work, um, there might have been somebody in the synagogue who let's say is a major supporter of some organization, be it APAC, something like that and may have seen it and said, this person should not be somebody that we have. Um, and, and, you know, this, this is how the world works. You all know that. I mean, and, and not, not that that's a good reason for firing somebody, but probably somebody said, how can we be paying somebody who believes this? That's my guess. I don't know. But um, so it may not have actually, you know, because the reason I say that is a week earlier, they're like, fine, you're, you, you can absolutely teach here. And then suddenly it's a 180 degree turn a week later. So that doesn't happen just because someone has new thoughts. That happens because somebody puts pressure on somebody. Um, I don't know. I, I, I could be speaking out of school. I could be totally wrong. I, I could be told because I'm sure that that I'm sure that 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 organization, that synagogue has donors to like we do at our congregation. We have uh, major supporters of APAC, which does incredible work. Uh, and we have major supporters of J Street, and we have supporters of Israel. I mean, we have we have a range. So clearly, there's 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 a range, but somehow something changed their view. Okay, so no one's going to answer the question. My my up. basic view: I don't think they should have fired her. That that I think is wrong. Uh, but I do think that that you know I, I I say if somebody's doing their job as a teacher and they're teaching the curriculum, and they have a right to certainly say you can't teach that in class. That's perfectly legitimate to say what you can. But, um, you know, I think that what the, the, the views, that approach is outside the bounds of Reform Judaism. Not that you can't discuss it. See, see, I, I think it's perfectly fine to discuss anything. You know, I'm, I'm a, totally opposed to any kind of censorship. But there, there, there is a kind of you know, we do have a framework in which we operate. And part of that framework is the notion that Israel is a Jewish state. Now, what that means is, is vastly up for interpretation. You know, there are, there, there, there are certainly extremes on both sides and we have to kind of find what's right. But the idea that, that one would, that, that, that one would be teaching that Israel commits genocide in a, in a synagogue 
it, it doesn't fit, you know, it's almost, it's almost, I mean, I, I hate to say that I don't want to be critical, you know, but, but it would be like, you know, a Catholic church has certain beliefs. We may not agree with them, but as a church, they have a right to uphold those beliefs, you know? And so as a synagogue, as a movement, we have certain core beliefs, you know, and, and by the way, even the reconstructionist movement does, I mean, you, you may know the story of uh, Rabbi Brant Rosen. Uh, Brant's a nice guy. I, I don't know him well. I once had lunch with him, but um, he uh, was the rabbi at the Reconstructionist Synagogue in Evanston. He, uh, his views evolved over time, and he, he became very, very anti-Zionist. I mean, he went and visited Iran, uh, and he essentially said he does not believe in a Jewish state um, and that Israel is committing genocide, um, and he was fired from synagogue that he led for a long time and was a pretty successful rabbi. I mean, they, they built a beautiful um, environmental building um, and he was well-liked generally. Um, but at, at a certain point, they basically said, this is, this is simply too radical for us. And he started a, another congregation called Setic Chicago, which exists. And it's just a little small congregation. It meets in a church, but you know, at a certain point, he was outside the bounds of even Reconstructionist Judaism, which is pretty wide boundaries. So you do have to have some certain boundaries, I think. Okay, other comments about that before we go to the next article. Okay, all right, what was I gonna do here? Okay, yeah, okay, and now, now we're gonna go to something very interesting. Rabbi? Is, yeah, go ahead, Meredith. Um, I think she should have been fired and I'll tell you why. <laughs> okay. Um, and that is once she published a blog, that was accessible to her students. And so in that case, she was um, making her views known to the students, even though not in the classroom per se. And mm -hmm. um, there, there have been several cases at Wheaton College, you know, you can't teach there unless you sign a faith statement. Yes. Um, and they have, uh, they fired someone not too long ago because they thought that the person was not quote, living the faith statement that they had signed. And they were making a value judgment. And so um, I think that um, um, private schools, religious organizations, um, you um, have to really compromise yourself if you're going to teach in a place like that, because um, your public life and your private life are not separate. Yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. And in some ways, when you sign on to work at a religious organization, it's not signing on like to work at a public school, for example. You know, at a public school, you know, you can get pregnant out of wedlock and that's fine. As long as you show up for your job and you do your job, no one cares. If you're doing that at a Catholic school, <laughs> it's a different story. Whether it should be or not, that's up for debate and discussion. But the reality is it is um, because they, they're, 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 when, when you teach it at a, at a religious organization, you uh, you either overtly by signing something like a Wheaton or perhaps implicitly you subscribe to a certain set of beliefs or or you you at least affirm that you will uphold a certain set of beliefs uh, and that is you know it raises all kinds of I mean this has actually gone to the Supreme Court because then I remember this I don't I may get the exact details wrong but it was something like a Catholic school. And the person was teaching music, was not, it was, was not teaching anything related to doctrine and not anything related to church teachings, but was teaching music. And I believe was not Catholic. I can't remember whether she was Catholic. No, she must've been Catholic, but got pregnant and was fired. Uh, and this case went to the Supreme Court and I believe the court ruled in favor of the school. I think it was a 5-4, but her argument was, I'm not teaching anything religious. It's not, you know, I, I'm essentially fulfilling a secular function. I am, I am teaching something and I've done a good job teaching it. And I'm not, don't present myself as a role model for the students. No, you know, uh, an organization can decide that. It's interesting. You know, we may, we may feel that that's wrong. On the other hand, religious organizations do have certain privileges that other organizations don't. And there's a good reason for that. Like if you were to hire a new rabbi, you couldn't say, uh, you, or you could say, 
You have to be Jewish and you have to be a rabbi to apply for this job. <laughs> if you're a secular organization, you can't do that. You can't say you have to be Jewish to apply for this job. You're not allowed to do that. Rightfully so. But if you're a religious organization, you do because you have certain beliefs. So religious organizations are, occupy a, 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 a kind of unique niche in employment law, in civil rights law. Okay, now I'm going to share with you a very interesting article. Now, where did I put that? Uh, okay, here, let me find this. Okay. Uh, oh, wait a minute. No, that's not what I want. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. This is, this is an article that Arnold Wolf wrote for his Temple Bulletin at KAM. Um, this is so so KAM. Um, can you see the article here? Everyone see it? Can everyone see it? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I'm just gonna read it. So this is October 19th, 1983. Oh, not that long ago. And this is after what happened in Lebanon, I think. Uh, okay. The Soviet Union brought down an unarmed civilian plane, which was apparently overflying some of its sensitive military installations, causing loss of life and international protests. The Soviet Union regularly ships guns to Central America in order to bring civic disorder and revolution. The Soviet Union is headed by a hardline former terrorist and spy who has resolutely opposed all moves for reduction of tensions. The Soviet Union has invaded neighboring nations, occupied and subdued them, annexing whole populations of different convictions of background. The Soviet Union has invaded neighboring, oh, I just read that. The Soviet Union permits dissent and debate among elites, but no freedom for its occupied or second-class populations. The Soviet Union has been repeatedly condemned by international community, but defends its actions by reminding the world national community, but defends its actions by reminding the world that it is surrounded by much larger hostile enemies who have refused to live with it in peace. In order to defend its right to exist, it has even quietly threatened the world nuclear destruction. Now go back and in reading this piece, please substitute for the Soviet Union each time the term the state of Israel. Ooh. The publication of this piece led to controversy and ferment at KAM, Isaiah Israel. Some were outraged at the uh, comparison, uh, extensive public discussions, meetings, letters, and bulletin pieces on all sides followed. Yes. What do you, I mean, this, this is 1983. So, I mean, I kind of like jar reading it right now. Imagine reading it 40 years ago. What do you think? Is this just, is, is, is it an apt comparison? to compare Israel to the former USSR? Or is this just a little bit um, too radical? What do you think he's trying to say in this? What, what is Arnold Wolf trying to say in this article? What was he trying to say? People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So you're saying he, so you're saying that because he's living in the United States, that really this is a uh, uh, not a fair criticism uh, because he doesn't know what it's like. Well, I was just being facetious. I, I mean, I think the synagogue and him both get a lot of credit if he wasn't fired and they could tolerate it and have this sort of discussion. I think that was great. I, I think he went overboard in the hyperbole about this Israel being the same as Russia, but Nevertheless, you could see some of his points made sense. Aha. Okay, that's great. So, yeah, th this was a thing about Arnold. That, that this is and this is very important. He didn't claim to speak for the synagogue. He claimed to be speaking for himself and inviting debate and discussion. Now, that's a fine line because when you're the rabbi of a synagogue, in some ways. You may not mean to speak for the synagogue, but people perceive you as speaking for the synagogue. He faced this same conflict when he was the rabbi at Solel when it came to Vietnam, you know. And so this this was a this was a perennial issue in his life. Um, but uh, 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 you're saying it may be a little wrong what he what he criticized. He, he may be wrong, but but the fact that he invited open debate and discussion that's commendable and good. Okay, Andy then Alice. Oh, actually, it was me this time. I, Rich. I, 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 I know you expected the other, but, you know, things happen. <laughs> no. So, I mean, the issue, and maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but, you know, 
Israel exists and they do great things. They also do things that aren't so great. So is a criticism of Israel anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism? And you know, it's not. And you, you call it like it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that that's that's uh that's a big question of anti-Semitism versus anti-Zionism. They're they're certainly different. And criticism of Israel does not necessarily mean anti-Semitism, right? So that's great. That's and that's an important point. Um, I I would say in this in this article though, he may be going over. He, he may be, it may be more than just criticism. I mean, in some ways, he's well, he's criticizing the entire sort of foreign policy approach. You know, he's not just criticizing one decision. He's saying, you know, invaded neighboring nations, occupying, subdued them, annexing in whole populations of different conviction and background. I mean, this is this is a pretty far fetched critique, and maybe that's fine. Maybe that's that's totally legitimate. Okay, Alice. It was there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in looking at it, it's like I had an initial reaction, um, but then when I thought about it more. To me, I think this is maybe Rabbi what your dad was saying a little bit. It 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 does provoke discussion, and and I think also it it makes you when I say you, it made me realize that I have certain assumptions when I read the words Soviet Union and when I read the word Israel, mm. and that maybe this is saying maybe you shouldn't make these assumptions, these overgeneral assumptions, maybe you have to look at, you know, each individual issue more carefully. That's beautifully put, beautifully put. And I think you're right. See, we all have certain biases, all of us, every human being. Uh, and our bias, if you want to, is that we look at Israel in the best possible light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and there's probably a lot of good reason for that, especially given what Sue said earlier about mm -hmm. living in a time when there wasn't a state of Israel and what the state of Israel did for the Jewish people, especially after the Holocaust. And so we have a kind of, we, we, we feel that Israel does a lot of good in the world, which it does. And so, but then we also have this bias of the Soviet Union that, you know, was was evil, the evil empire, you know, and 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 was wrong. I mean, maybe evil, maybe too side, you know, was was extremely negative, you know, especially with Jews from the former Soviet Union were not permitted to leave and so forth. We know that history, um, especially given what's happening now. I mean, you know, we can't separate from, you know, what the kind of world we're experiencing right now. So we don't see Israel and the former Soviet Union at all in the same realm. And yet here, Arnold Jacob Wolf did. Uh, you know, when he's talking about arms sales, you know, he's talking about South Africa. That was a big, you know, Israel sold a lot of weapons to South Africa. Um, mm. and that Israel was roundly criticized for that a lot. Um, uh, and that's, that's in many ways why Nelson Mandela and the ANC were not, you know, Desmond Tutu is not the biggest fan of Israel. And a lot of that goes back to the fact that Israel was selling arms to uh, South Africa. Now it stopped. They stopped at a certain, you know, the, the, you know, at a certain point it ended, but there was that history there. Um, even though in South Africa, there were many Jews who were leaders of the anti-apartheid movement. I mean, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, some of Nelson Mandela's best friends. In fact, I believe Nelson Mandela's second wedding was at the house of one of his Jewish supporters. I you know, but, but Israel had a bad reputation in South Africa. So um, there are things that, you know, Israel did that were open, ripe for criticism. Okay. Other comments on this piece? Go ahead. Anybody? Yeah, Sue, go ahead. And then I want to show another article. Um, okay. Well, I did not know of Arnold Jacob Wolf. Uh, I didn't belong to Solel when he was the rabbi. A long time ago. Yes. Um, but I have a problem with him comparing Israel with the Soviet Union. And I, yes, it does give us food for thought. Look, at we know that Menachem Begin had been a terrorist. <laughs> uh, but 
I think this is the thing that people are forgetting and him included. Why was Israel behaving the way it did? Where did all this come from? Arabs have never let Jews or Israelis live in peace. Right. Not ever. Right. They've always had to take, try to take the upper hand and protect themselves and defend themselves. And yes, they haven't always, I, I don't agree with everything. I mean, I, I think it's ridiculous what they've done with settlements. I think it was David Ben-Gurion who once said that the settlements would come back to haunt us. Yeah. And he was right. Uh, they should have, you know, just won their land back, get what you need to get and stay out of the rest of it. I mean, there have been lots of mistakes, but I think this was overkill. Yeah. What he wrote. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, he, he probably, he was deliberately provocative, which, you know, may not be the best quality in a rabbi. <laughs> you know, no, it's not, I mean, it's a technique. You should, but that was his, that was his approach. You know, he would say something to get somebody going. You know, and it was a mode of, in some ways, a mode of debate and discussion. And, and he once said, if 10% of your synagogue doesn't want you fired, you're not a successful rabbi. I, I don't subscribe to that idea. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best approach, but that's what he said. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he had a certain style. And I think that's probably what he was doing in this article. Is it, is it, is it in kind of goes to an extreme to make a point. And then, you know, and then we might agree with that point, um, but we might not express it to the degree that he does. Um, and I think also the interesting thing is that back then, even 40 years ago, there was very little room for dissent in the American Jewish community. You know, in essentially, there was no discussion of a Palestinian state. Not really. I think I'm told. I think I said last week that I would when I was researching this in 1992 when he was running for president. Bill Clinton opposed the creation of a Palestinian state. You know that's 1992. So even then, the idea of two states was outside the pale of mainstream Jewish opinion. Now that's considered the mainstream. Um, so you know, even though we're living in such a tense time, there is at least an openness to criticism that might not have been there 40 years ago. You know, 40 years ago, you, it was like, that's our dirty laundry. We don't air that in public. If you're gonna be critical, do it behind closed doors. You know, do it, you know, don't, don't let that out. You know, we, 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 we wanna present a unified front to the world. Now that, that rules out the window. There, you, you can be as divisive as possible. Yeah, Andy or Rich. Yeah, I, I think that, um, yeah, that was well stated that that we um, if we can't really own up to ourselves and have a conscience, if we're the light of nations and we, you know, and we profess that um, we need to be called to task. I, I don't feel that we I, I think that the direction we're going in is much better. And I think there's far too much. Um, people th have an idea and they think that's how Israel is or they think how something else is or and I'm going to just hark back to your comment about APAC how many people know that they are supporting endorsing Jim Jordan as well as a lot of other um, Republicans who don't want um, to uh, have a January 6th thing how many people know that APAC is endorsing Jim Jordan and to know that well okay I don't want to get into a discussion about that but 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 the truth the truth yeah, I, well, one could argue, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna argue, but one could argue <laughs> that APEC has a single issue focus that doesn't matter if it was Jim Jordan or, uh, you know, who's the most liberal, uh, Jarmila, the, the uh, representative from um, Seattle, who's, uh, doesn't matter where their views are, if they are pro Israel, according to what APEC says, they're gonna support them. Like it's, it's, it's like, their, their their views on other issues don't really matter, so that mm -hmm. say, that 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 could be how how APEC thinks. I don't know. I'm I don't, I'm not as involved, you know. So well, that, that, that is their that, that is their argument. That's exactly yeah. what they say when they receive criticism. Yeah. 
So, I mean, at least it's a consistent standard. I mean, you know, it, it, it tries to, to kind of, um, you know, it's a one issue, it's a one issue organization, you know, and that, that's why the fact, the reason, the, the fact that APAC's a one issue organization is why there are other organizations like the RAC, like National Council of Jewish Women and all the, you know, there's so many others. Um, okay, I wanna share with you, this is the last article I wanna look at. This is really, really interesting. Now, I mentioned rabbis earlier. Oh, this was another article in the New York Times. You know, the New York Times, is, it's, it's very interesting. It, it is um, a lot of uh, uh, more conservative Jews do not like the New York Times and not simply because of, you know, uh, politics. It, when it comes to Israel, the New York Times, you know, goes places other papers don't. This was a really interesting article uh, about rabbinical students called Inside the Raveling, Unraveling of American Zionism. A new generation of Jewish leaders began to rethink their support for Israel. And in this picture right here are two students at Hebrew Union College. And one of them on the right, his name is Evan. So I like him. His name is Evan Trailer, um, African-American guy. Uh, I believe he's from Oklahoma City. He's a rabbinical student right now. He was the uh, president of uh, NIFTI, North, uh, North American Federation of Temple Youth. Uh, I don't know who the person on the left is. Uh, I forget what, I, but I know him. Um, uh, Leah Nussbaum. Okay, so she's another student. Um, uh, they, they, uh, they're on different campuses. And a few months ago, there was a, the issue when um, Israel was going to uh, uh, assume ownership of certain houses in a neighborhood, neighborhood called Sheikh Jarrah which is in East Jerusalem. And um, Israel was going to repossess certain homes that had been in Palestinian hands. And, you know, there, were, there was a lot of conflict over who's the real owner, you know? Nobody had clear title, if you know, to use uh, American uh, contractual language. And um, it became a huge issue. Uh, there were evictions um, and um, it kind of represented the conflict that was going on. Um, then in the second week of May, a few members of the group chat of rabbinical students convened on Zoom and drafted an open letter calling on American Jews to adjust their orientation toward Israel. By this time, the conflict had begun to widen. Hamas, the militant Islamic party, fired hundreds of rockets at Israeli town, Israel retaliated with airstrikes, eventually more than 250 were killed, including 12 civilians in Israel and over 100 in Gaza. You remember this, it was just a few months ago. This is the letter from the rabbinical students. Blood is flowing in the streets of the Holy Land. For those of us for whom Israel has represented hope and justice, we need to give ourselves permission to watch, to acknowledge what we see, to mourn and to cry, and then to change our behavior and demand better. They urge Jews to rethink their support for American military aid to Israel, which totals roughly $3.8 billion annually. Now, you gotta remember, a lot of that $3.8 million comes back to the United States because it's used to buy weapons from American manufacturers. Now we may disagree whether that's good or bad, but a lot of it comes back to, to the United States. So America has other interests in that foreign aid besides you know, support for Israel. That's important to know. They insisted that Jewish educators complicate their teaching of Israel's founding to convey the messy truth of a persecuted people searching for safety, going to a land full of meaning for the Jewish people, full of meaning for so many other people, and also full of human beings who didn't ask for new neighbors. Oof. The letter contains several uh, provocations. It compared the Palestinians' plight to that of Black Americans. Da, 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 da. American Jews have been part of a racial reckoning in our community. So this is after uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, it described in Israel two separate legal systems for the same region and later called this system apartheid. Use, use that, that word. Um, there, and it did not contain, alongside its indictment of Israel's action, to straightforward condemnation of Hamas's aiming weapons at civilians. So it did not talk about Hamas. There are an extraordinary 93 names at the bottom of the letter, which can be seen as a Google Doc. They hailed from eight institutions, virtually every one in the United States that trains rabbis and cantors outside of Orthodox Judaism. Some 17% of the institution students signed the letter, according to uh, figures provided by the school. Um, uh, okay. Uh, and then it was in the forward. The seminary's communities erupted with arguments. Rabbi Bradley Artson, a wonderful rabbi, 
in Los Angeles, um, uh, objected to the letter and he wrote a, an opinion piece. Uh, a teacher at HUC in uh, Jerusalem uh, said he was troubled and hurt. Um, and then one signer even had a rabbinical internship revoked. Interesting, so they lost their job. And then Rabbi Angela Buchdahl, who's a pretty famous rabbi, she's the rabbi of Central Synagogue in New York, she said she wouldn't hire anybody who signed that letter. So that was interesting. Um, da, da, da. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, the letter intimated not only that the pro-Israel consensus is fraying, but something else too. The primary cause of this fraying may not be something as straightforward as the actions of Israel's government or the assimilation of American Jews. Instead, a generation of Jews is confronting head on the tension between Jewish universalist principles and the idea of Jewish particularity, that Jews possess special obligations towards one another. For years, American Jews could look upon Israel as a tiny state full of long oppressed people with hostile neighbors and even see themselves as underdogs in their own country. So this tension could remain largely out of view. Now, then the, it goes on to history that we've all covered, um, goes to history of reform Judaism. But then I want to get, um, I want to get to the, to, to the fact that, um, da, 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 da. Uh, they're talking about one of the students who's very interesting, um, uh, da, 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 the existence of Israel, kibbutz, um, here, here. But it's not hard to see why young Jew Americans who recently awakened to a new way of thinking about racism in their own country would find parallels in Israel. Evan Trailer, the guy I like because of his name, a second year student at Hebrew Union College in New York campus who signed the letter, felt the connection while touring a refugee camp outside Bethlehem. His group passed a poster featuring a boy putatively shot and killed by the Israeli military and someone remarked that they didn't believe it. There must have been more to the story. Even though it happens all the time in the US, he said to me, as a black Jew, there's a really powerful connection. I felt it differently perhaps than a lot of white Jews. Oh, interesting. Now, here's the counter argument. When Alana Rabishaw, a fifth year student at HSU's LA campus, saw the letter signed by many of her contemporaries on Facebook, she knew she wanted to respond, but not right away. Israel was under attack, and my friends in Israel were getting called up and running a bomb shelter. It didn't feel like the time to be fighting with my classmates in America. Once a ceasefire had been established, she and other rabbinical students who had gone to Israel in a fellowship affiliated with APAC chatted for a while about what they wished to see. She wrote a response, they signed it, and it was published in the forward near the end of May. The sheer volume of colleagues on the letter made us reticent to speak up, her letter said, but we knew that any, we know that any conversation about Israel deserves nuance and dialogue, and that to remain silent to leave the impression to the Jewish community that you speak for all of us, which you don't. Ooh. Um, da, da, da. Um, now, uh, when I met Rabbi Shah, who's 27 in LA, she was coming from American Jewish University in Bel Air, um, and a mikvah. She had been assisting a conversion. She is a rabbinical internet congregation called Me in West Hollywood, which is a bastion for LGBTQ Jews. Yeah, it's a beautiful congregation. Um, uh, I've learned, uh, I, I, uh, she's referring to her mentor. I've learned from her how to share and teach progressive values in the years and are not incongruous with being a passionate Zionist. Um, uh, here's, the, here's the kicker. I wasn't shocked that this was the direction that a lot of my classmates would take. However, I was pretty disappointed that there was such a lack of Ahavat Yisrael in a time when Israel was under attack. Ahavat Yisrael. This is the key tension. So when we talk about Israel, are we talking simply in a critical way because we're progressives, let's say, and Israel is violating certain progressive norms? Or are we talking with Ahavat Yisrael, which means a love of Israel, in the same way a parent would speak about a child or a brother about a sister? When we are critical, are we critical with love and clear compassion and care? Or are we critical in a simply dispassionate way that's saying, sorry, you're racist, you're genocidal, we're embarrassed by you. That is the issue here. That is the Ahavat Yisrael. And it's the same way, like, if somebody is critical of you, I mean, I, I deal with this all the time. People are critical. You have to have, you know, people can be critical of something. But you, if it's, if someone is critical and you know they really care, they care about you and they care about the cause, you listen to their criticism more than you would listen to somebody you don't really know and you don't 
you, you know, or you know that they're clearly biased in one direction or another. So what this tension is, is this rabbinical student, Rabbi Ilana Rabishaw, who's, uh, her, her, her dad is from Chicago. He's a rabbi in, uh, he might be in California now, but he's from Chicago, from Glenview, grew up at BJBE. Um, and um, she's saying, I understand where my students are coming from. I was not surprised, but I was surprised by how a lack of deep compassion for Israelis, a deep compassion for the Jewish state, I feel in their letter. They don't even mention Hamas. I understand what their arguments are, but you cannot be objective when it comes to Israel. Whereas the students are saying what Israel is doing is is, is, is against all of our values as Americans. This is a tough conflict. This is very hard to navigate. It's almost like, you know, people used to ask the question, if Israel and the United States went to war, who would you side with? People would ask that question and that would generate, and, and most people would answer, well, that's not possible because we're on the same side of almost all issues, right? Now, but this is a different, way of asking the same question. If American values and one could say Israeli values clash, where do you side? Not saying it's black and white that way, but it it's pro pushing that question. Okay, Alice, I'm talking a lot. Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to go back to something I think Sue was referring to. You know, I, I really do see it as this generational thing, because if you grew up I'm a little younger than Sue, but I still, I, I was born right around, you know, right after the state of Israel. And, you know, going to Sunday school all those years, I mean, that was, there was just this pride of the state of Israel being formed that was taught to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was actually at uh, North Suburban Synagogue Bethel right. <laughs> back in the, back in the sixties. Mm -hmm. And, and and you know, I went to Israel right after the Six Day War, and it was just, it was just imbued in me this love of Israel. And I, th I think that isn't even with all the birthright and everything. I don't know. I don't think there's the same feeling of among the younger generation of this love of Israel that, as you were saying, that that would come first, and then you can still criticize somebody or something that you love but that the love underpins everything. And I, I'm not sure that love is there in the younger generation, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a great point. It's a, it's a great point. And you know, the interesting thing is, it may not be possible to recreate that love. You know, you went to Israel at a, at a different time. You know, Israel was a young country. It was not, it was not the Israel of today you know, which is a pretty much a first world country. I mean, it's prosperous. I, I remember when I went there, the internet was faster in Israel than it was here. Now this was 2001, it was just much, Israel was in some ways more technologically advanced in the United States then. Um, uh, cell phones worked better there. And, and, and so Israel is a immensely successful country. It's not like the, it's not like David versus Goliath, you know, Israel's in some ways a Goliath, a, but, but so, so it may be impossible to recreate that. Um, but, but it's not totally impossible because this other rabbinical student feels it, you know, um, she, you know, uh, Rabbi Ravishaw. Okay, other comments on this. This generated a lot of anger and debate. Anyone, anyone, uh, what would you say if, 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 if one of these uh, students, let's say we had an opening, we, we don't, and, you know, but let's say we had an opening for a rabbinical intern, you know, would, uh, would anyone, would you say we shouldn't hire someone who signed that letter? What would you say? Let's say you were on the hiring committee, if we were going to hire an intern for a year. Would someone on that letter be, and so then what if, what, if, what if somebody could, let, let's say somebody came up to you. Let's say you said, okay, yeah, we should hire her. And then somebody came up to you and said, why do you support hiring somebody for our synagogue that, that says Israel's an apartheid state? I could, I, could be I could be mistaken, but I thought Evan Trailer once 
worked for the URJ originally. I thought he was a, spoke at the biennial two years, three years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, before this letter. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. But, but I, you know, I, I doubt if, you know, but those had to be his views then too. I mean, he was, he was a very well-spoken gentleman at the, at the biennial. Wow, uh, yeah, no, he's great. He's a great guy. I know I um, said, but that's an interesting question. Well, I, I, if, if the union, were, let, let's say he graduates from rabbinical school and he gets hired by the union, I can almost guarantee you there'd be some, there'd be some tension. Maybe it, maybe it would just be a few people, but there would certainly be questions about whether that's right or not. Um, you know, uh, so I'm not, I'm not saying that, uh, that, that they won't get jobs, but you know, the, uh, you know, the rabbi at central said she wouldn't hire anyone who signed that letter. Um, so let's say we would say it is okay to hire somebody. How then would you respond? Uh, Rich, how, how would you, let's say, let's say the commission on social action, which you're a part of hired him out of school. And then somebody would say, said to you, how can you hire somebody who says Israel's an apartheid state? What would you say? Well, you know, I, I, I think when you get into specific accusations like that, I think there's a, you know, well, I think, you know, when you get into specific accusations, you know, they probably need to be discussed further. But yeah. hiring somebody who expresses, you know, you know, I, I think most of what he said is probably true. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. So it's I mean, good. No, no, no. So you know, um, you know, I, I mentioned it to you. You know, that book by uh, Daniel Sokatch. Yes, we uh, wanted to have him speak, and he canceled on us. I was mad about that, but yeah, he's terrific. Book, outstanding yeah. book. If you want to know what I think was a truly unbiased history of Israel, I think it's outstanding. I would, I would say. Um, in terms of hiring, if that would came up, I would like to have someone, a leader who will make me really challenge my Jewish values. What's in concert? And we haven't even mentioned that. We've talked about, you know, United States, Israel, where you ally yourself with. But what about the teachings? And, um, you know, it's funny because I went to the same place Alice did. I, was, I mean, you're older. And I, I mean, I remember all that, but it didn't sink into me. I never, it was sort of like, uh, I don't know. It, it, if anything, it just pushed, the whole thing pushed me away. But um, but anyway, that's what I would want. We all respond differently, you know? Yeah. There's, um, yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to think to myself what I would say if I were, you know, uh, you know, if, if, if we hired somebody like that and somebody, you know, was critical and, you know, I kind of, I love hearing different opinions. You know, I, I, I like debate and dialogue. I think that's what's most engaging and interesting um, when people disagree with you and you can have a discussion respectfully, you know, uh, you don't want to devolve into name calling and things, but I think it's wonderful when we have different points of view and there is something to be said of somebody who understand who, who is where American Jews, younger American Jews are at now. On the other hand, when you are a rabbi, you're kind of a role model. So it goes kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier. So this is a, this is a very hard question to unpack. And I think it kind of, it makes, it makes being Jewish, it makes, it makes the Jew, the Jewish connection between Jewish makes the connect the, the identity of American Jews more complicated and difficult. You know, in some ways, the easiest way to be a Jew is just to move to Israel, you know, but when you're an American Jew, it's harder. It's harder. Okay, Sue, last comment, then we gotta we gotta conclude. Uh, okay, so I was just gonna say that everybody looks at this, this from their own narrative. Yes. And this uh, what's his name? Your friend? Evan <laughs> Trailer. Okay, he He's got his narrative as a black Jew in America. And I have a narrative as a white Jew who grew up in the 50s, yes. uh, 40s and 50s, actually. <laughs> and um, I, as I said, I remember so clearly before 
I remember my parents listening to the UN vote at the United Nations on our one radio. And um, we went to Israel in the 80s. And all I remember is our guide and we went everywhere. And everywhere he took us is this is where the Jews hid from these people. This is where the Jews hid from these people. This is where, and I remember on the plane coming home and I said to my husband, oh my God, our people were always hiding. And that's what has stuck with me. Mm, mm. So I'm from a different narrative yeah. than he is. Yeah. And I don't like the fact that he called Israel an apartheid state. Yeah, that's such an astute point, Sue. Um, we're, we're operating from certain narratives and he's operating from a narrative of, of being a, an African-American Jew and, and young, you know, somebody who grew up way after Israel was established as a country and, and you know, didn't experience, you know, the founding or the six day war. Um, it, it is, this, this, is um, th th this is why this is such a tense issue right now as we're operating from, from different narratives. And these narratives touch on sort of fundamental questions of identity. You know, it's not just a narrative about, you know, you look at politics, this is not just a narrative about high taxes versus low taxes, you know, that, that this is fundamental identity. And that's what makes it so complicated. Well, thank you guys. This was a great discussion. And uh, I will see you all next week. Thank you. Hi, everybody.